This meeting is being recorded. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and I am delighted to be here today with three longtime colleagues and good friends to talk about the issue of lower for longer macro credential policy issues arising from the low interest rate environment. This is a new report from the European Systemic Risk Board. Um, and it will be presented today by Professor Richard Portis. Um, just to give a bit of context, of course, uh, first just institutional and, and in terms of focus, the Peterson Institute is very proud to be one of the major fora uh, for discussion and one of the major places for new policy research on European macroeconomic and financial issues was just within the last two weeks, we had the pleasure to host the ECB's chief economist, Philip Lane, for the American instance of the ECB Listens Tour as part of their European, excuse me, their monetary policy strategy review. Um, at the same time, the financial stability side of the ECB network and the European system of central banks has been hard at work. And so they just released this report. Um, at the end of 2019, pre-COVID, the European Systemic Risk Board General Board mandated a task force on low interest rates to revisit an earlier report from 2016. Um, and not only do progress report and look at subsequent developments, but assess whether new sources of systemic risk has emerged. Furthermore, the task force was to talk about new policy actions aimed at mitigating potential systemic risks. So today we are going to be talking about the report which came out roughly a week and a half ago. Um, the one issue in particular they're looking at is whether search for yield behavior has intensified in the banking investment fund sectors and what that means for the sustainability of business models. Uh, in order to present the report, today we have leading off, as mentioned, Professor Richard Portis, who's Professor of Economics at the London Business School, was of course the founder and, honorary, and remains Honorary President of the Center for Economic Policy Research, the major economic research network in Europe, and the co-founder of the journal Economic Policy. Uh, he is a member of the General Board of the European Systemic Risk Board, and importantly for this, he chairs the ESRB's Advisory Scientific Committee and co-chairs the ESRB's Joint Expert Group on Non-Bank Financial Intermediation. Also relevant for this, he is an academic director of the AQR Asset Management Institute at uh, London Business School. Uh, Richard has many, many honors, um, including three honorary doctorates, starting his career as a rogue scholar, being an elected fellow of the Econometric Society in the British Academy. He was made CBE commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire in the 2003 New Year's Honors and is a longtime friend and colleague to us at the Peterson Institute. After Richard's presentation, we will be hearing from Barbara Novick. Barbara comes to us, thank, I'm grateful to say and proud to say as a member of the Peterson Institute board. Uh, she has been at the center of discussions over public policy and regulation regarding financial services, investment firms, uh, consumer rights, and um, in her role as a co-founder of BlackRock in 1988. And she just transitioned this year, earlier this year, from vice chairman to senior advisor at BlackRock. Um, she will be speaking in her personal capacity as a member of the board of the Peterson Institute and a veteran of these debates. But I want to remind people that in 2009, Ms. Novick established BlackRock's Global Public Policy Group and ran that until uh, her retirement from BlackRock. Uh, finally, speaking third today is my colleague, Nicolas Veron, who is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. He's also a senior fellow at Bruegel, the leading economic think tank in Europe uh, that he helped co-found. And I'm proud to recognize that we have just passed the one year anniversary of his financial statements virtual event series, which has been a major forum in addition to the Peterson Institute's portfolio of activities 
bringing together not just European, but global policymakers and private sector experts, as well as academics to discuss public policy issues in the financial sphere. So in that order, let me now turn first to Richard Portis, please. Okay, let me try to share my screen. Uh, and there it is. Let's do it. And you should have it. Yep. Uh, at least I have it as a shared screen. Uh, so we all, have, we all have it, Richard. It's good. Very good. Okay. Uh, let me uh, first uh, pay tribute to my co-chairs of this task force and the many people who worked uh, with us on it uh, and uh, make it clear that, however, that the views that I'm expressing today are entirely my own. Uh, the report will speak for itself to anyone who wants to read it. You can get that off the, um, uh, off the, uh, off the web as shown right at the bottom of this slide. Uh, and uh, and uh, there is also a Vox EU column about the report, uh, if you want the short form. Okay, so let me see whether I can advance my slides here. Come on. No, oh, come on. Let's do it. No. Uh, okay, we made it. Let's hope it isn't that slow next time around. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit. Oops. Uh, overreacted. Go back. It's just very slow for some reason. Um, there we go. Okay. Uh, so uh, very quickly on the role of macro potential policy. This report is about macro crew, not about monetary policy. And we had to take great care not to intrude on the European search cycle by current review of its monetary policy strategy. That said, it's obvious that macro potential policy must take into account the effects of monetary policy on financial stability. Uh, and I believe it can be complementary. Richard, we're having a bit, we're having a weird speeding up of your speech on the audio. Could, could you, could you, I apologize to our audience and to Richard, but just pause a second and recheck your audio, please. Very strange. Okay. Um, let's, um, let's try to, uh, that sounds better. Get full so screen. Let's continue. Are you hearing me properly now? Better, not properly, but better. Are you hearing me? No, I'm not hearing you properly. Um, all right. Uh, we're, we're going to have to uh, do a little trick. Well, maybe what we should do is have uh, you just go to audio and have Lily Day run the slides, if that, I think, will increase your bandwidth. I'm terribly sorry, Richard. I'm terribly sorry everyone is listening in this. We had checked the audio prior to starting, and it seemed fine, but I fear that the video is too much bandwidth for Richard's setup. So, Lily, are you available to run slides if we turn Richard back to audio? Um, okay, hold on. Oh no, that sounds better, Richard. Okay, please. I know, please. but uh, but oh, are you and you're getting that is fine, isn't it? Yes, that's fine. Please continue. Sorry. All right, I'm not sure what happened, um, but let's go back. Uh, and now, and now it's moving properly. Uh, so what I was saying <laughs> before I was so rudely interrupted uh, is that. Uh, there is clearly a relationship between macroprudential policy and monetary policy. We have to take account of the effects of monetary policy on financial stability. Um, and we have to take account also of the fact that the monetary authorities sometimes are moved as they were last March to intervene as lenders of last resort or market makers of last resort uh, to safeguard financial stability. Macropru should seek to limit the need for that but it's something, again, that we have to take into account. 
So there's the roadmap of what I want to go through. Uh, the low um, natural or neutral or equilibrium real rate of interest, uh, its causes and consequences very quickly. The impact of COVID-19, uh, our assessment of that on the, in particular, on the natural rate. Uh, and then our risk assessment, uh, then the e implications of the risk assessment for policy. Uh, and I hope that you will agree as we go through is that, um, that this is relevant, not just to the EU, uh, but more, more widely. And I just include the latest quote um, I could find uh, that uh, uh, reminds us that, you know, we may be out of the woods for the moment, but um, those woods are very big and there are lots of bears out there uh, and we have to be careful. Uh, so let's start just by looking at the data uh, and you can see you know, the trend. Since the Volcker um, monetary policy tightening of the early 80s, rates have trended downwards everywhere. Whether you look at nominal, whether you look at real, whether you look at short term, whether you look at long term, uh, but I'll call your attention particularly to the lower right hand side of this slide where you see estimates of the euro area equilibrium uh, real rate. Um, that is to say, the real rate that would be consistent with full employment and stable and low inflation. Uh, and you can see, the, you don't observe R star, that, that real rate, um, but there are lots of different ways of trying to estimate it. Uh, and this gives you a range of estimates and all those estimates trend downwards. Uh, so let me move on. Uh, why should that be the case? Well, the report has a whole chapter about that. Uh, and the, the, the basic story is savings up, investment down. Uh, and that's partly because of demography. It's partly because of the, uh, as development proceeds, the rising savings rate in developing economies and their demand, consequent demand for assets uh, uh, issued by the advanced economies. The falling relative price of investment goods, it's easy to document that. And the rising share of intangible investment, uh, which is also uh, very re remarkably strong in the data. And by the way, there is a data appendix to this report that has 50 or so different charts and tables and so forth, uh, that um, even if you don't want to read the report, you might find all those data useful. Uh, the falling pace of technological innovation, that again is well documented. The falling marginal product and capital, uh, and that too, uh, we have some good evidence on. Uh, and the rise in the inequality of wealth, in particular of wealth relevant here, but also income. Uh, and then the evolution of the consumption wealth ratio, which um, some research suggests is very closely related to uh, the underlying real interest rates. Uh, and of course, many of these factors hold not just for the EU, uh, but more broadly. And interest rates are transmitted globally through the global financial cycle. So um, the trend is not your friend in this case. That trend um, is a creates problems. Uh, the current low interest rate environment is the problem. Uh, the decline in R star uh, is um, uh, responsible for the declining monetary declining policy rates and market rates uh, uh, out there uh, until you get to the effective lower bound, at which point R star keep, may keep going down, but um, market rates and, uh, uh, and um, policy rates are to some extent limited. There's the effective lower bound. It may be somewhat less than zero, uh, but not a whole lot. Um, the, on the financial side too, not, it's not just all those real sector factors that were on the last slide, but also the increased risk aversion by financial institutions uh, and regulatory pressures that boosted the demand for safe assets. Uh, we believe that the COVID-19 shock 
will strengthen the likelihood of lower prolonger. And I'll come to a slide in a moment of balancing the arguments on that. Won't go into it in great detail. But note that this, the impact of the low interest rate environment extends throughout the financial sector, uh, including right at the bottom there, the exposures of households and non-financial corporations. And I'll come back to those. So here's our uh, assessment uh, on the one hand and on the other hand uh, of uh, the impact of COVID-19. Uh, you can look quickly down this. I'm not going to go through each of these points. Um, I would myself stress, I suppose, uh, that um, uh, that uh, increased uncertainty induces households to increase savings for precautionary motives, and therefore, in part, therefore, the stories that we see have seen about excess savings uh, are exaggerated. Um, also, uh, I think the stimulus that the United States is, is currently uh, going through will be relatively short-lived. And on the European side, the fiscal stimulus, um, much as we are grateful that there's some, uh, it's not enough. And then on the, there are a number of arguments for rates going up. And some of those are just the opposite of the arguments I've just given you. Uh, and uh, again, you have to make up your own minds where you stand. I think we stood uh, quite clearly on the view, and it's supported by the way uh, by historical evidence on the uh, long-term effects of pandemics that suggests very clearly that um, uh, after a pandemic, interest rates are significantly depressed and they stay that way for a long time. So that's where we end up. Uh, now, what's the consequence? The search for yield, we know about that. Um, and I'll come back to it. Uh, but um, the data are clear for insurance companies and pension funds. Uh, if, if holding negative yielding debt to maturity um, is not a way to survive, um, especially if you promised high positive returns in, for example, defined benefit pension funds, uh, which are in deep trouble, many of them, including my own, by the way. Uh, bond funds may see investors moving out. Uh, constant net asset value money market funds uh, is that business really sustainable? Um, the banking sector in Europe, in particular, is very important for non-financial corporation funding, uh, and it is weak. It was weak before the COVID shock. Um, it was weak before interest rates got to their current very low levels, uh, but it's even weaker now in many ways. The one thing that is not as weak is that it's built up a fair amount of capital. Uh, and so did not, there were not significant failures uh, as a result of the shock of last year. But nevertheless, um, the return on equity market book valuations are off. Uh, and the negative nominal interest rates in many dimensions are challenges for the banking sector, partly because they can't charge, in, in some countries in Europe, they're not allowed to charge. Uh, negative rates on the positive. Um, and the um, consequence, we'll see, a little, we'll see a little graph in a moment uh, of the consequence of all. Now, you have to keep in mind that policy rightfully is sought to encourage investor risk taking at the microeconomic level. And that just makes the, the point that the macro proof is there to contain the negative systemic effects of the search for you. Uh, and here's a, 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 a paragraph to show you what I was talking about for the banks. The three top lines on the left-hand side uh, are the uh, shifts into riskier market segments uh, that we've seen in the past uh, several years. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, what's happened to the net interest income of the banks. That's the net interest margin has gone down and down. Uh, the interest earning assets have expanded very substantially. So that net interest income is about the same, but can that go on? I think unlikely. Uh, and as you've seen on the left hand side, we see the search for real. Uh, so, what's 
the implication of all that. Uh, the uh, risk analysis we undertake at great length in chapter three of the report uh, points to four areas, four sensitive areas. There's the banking sector, where the low interest rate environment uh, accentuates the negative effects of the existing overcapacity, the existing uh, poor cost management of European banks, and puts a lot of pressure on their viability, really, um, and their resilience. Uh, and that's something we want to address. Private sector indebtedness has gone up significantly, leverage, uh, because it's cheap. Wonderful. I have a big mortgage, too. Um, and um, uh, in many cases, both households and firms are vulnerable to shocks, not to mention government. But that's something we certainly won't get into. Uh, then there's systemic risk uh, for li systemic liquidity risk. Uh, and there are various forces that have uh, gone along with the low interest rate environment to uh, augment systemic liquidity risk uh, in the system. And we saw that in the March Madness last year, where uh, although we came out of it reasonably well, um, it's often forgotten these days. Now, well, survived all that. Um, what's the problem? Well, the answer is partly that central banks did have to step in on a very big scale to ensure that we did get out. Uh, and then there's the there are the problems of the insurance and pension fund sector, uh, which um, are complicated or augmented by their negative duration gap uh, and the uh, effects, therefore, of all the fall in interest rates on their balance sheets, which have been pretty disastrous. Uh, so let's see what to do about it. Um, and we come up with lots of possibilities. Um, if they only implement a few of these, I think we'll be very happy. Um, but actually, they need to implement most, if not all of them. Uh, when I say they, I mean the authorities and the private sector, uh, both. Uh, so we have lots of, in, in Europe, we have lots of obstacles to banking sector consolidation uh, and to the restructuring of banks. Um, it's partly national, national factors involved, but partly broader issues uh, in dealing with the banks. We have a framework, supposedly, to deal with weak banks, but it is not really functional. Uh, we have inadequate incentives for the banks to accelerate their digital transformation, to compete with the fintechs uh, and, and big techs, indeed. Uh, and we think that um, it's worthwhile, and this was, a, this is a very controversial issue in some countries, at least. Uh, we think it's worthwhile to assess the legal restrictions in some countries on negative interest rates for deposits. Uh, and we have a, a section on this in the report uh, with some evidence of the consequences of doing that for the countries that have done it uh, and so forth. Um, the indebtedness and viability of borrowers, um, we are very concerned with the high levels of corporate indebtedness. Uh, and uh, we suggest some measures that might uh, address that. Um, and we certainly feel, and ESRB has been very active in this area, the European Systemic Risk Board in issuing uh, warnings and then recommendations, which are stronger than warnings, uh, to uh, country authorities on macro pro measures targeted at households in particular housing sector borrowing. Uh, and then there's systemic liquidity risk, um, where we suggest that um, there should be macroprudential liquidity requirements for insurers, uh, that the liquidity buffers should actually be usable uh, uh, when there is liquidity stress, um, and that uh, liquidity requirements should be more generally applied uh, in the whole of the financial system, uh, taking into account the very substantial degree of interconnections in the system. And then finally, uh, we uh, propose uh, to uh, try to do something about the 
business models of insurers and pension funds that offer longer term guarantees. Uh, and the European IOPA, uh, the uh, European Regulatory Authority uh, for the uh, insurers and pension funds uh, has made various proposals. There is a review of the current European Union directive that governs uh, the insurance sector. And we believe that macroprudential measures should be included in that review and that there should be a proper recovery and resolution framework for insurance companies, which we lack. Uh, and then um, improving systemic risk analysis. This is not just an academic thing. Uh, we academics like to look at the numbers, uh, but um, the numbers are often not there. Uh, and I give you one example from the um, European Systemic Risk Board um, annual publication that I have a lot of responsibility for uh, the monitor of the risk monitor for what is now called the risk monitor for non-bank financial intermediaries. Um, uh, it used to be the shadow banking risk monitor, but we can't use that term anymore. Uh, and uh, the um, a, a look at the data every year, and every year there is a huge component in the data of other financial institutions which cannot be identified in any granular way. It's coming down, more of them are being found as it were, but the flow of funds is what gives you the overall numbers and getting granular data on the other financial institutions. You find the same thing in the FSB annual uh, uh, risk monitor, um, this, this, this problem of getting data. Uh, and we make some suggestions about that. Um, we, uh, uh, in particular, are concerned that the liquidity stress tests that are there for a number of areas of the financial sector, that they are micro, that they look at individual firms. Uh, and uh, the difficulty is that if um, uh, individual firms seek to use their liquidity or bolster their liquidity uh, in a crisis, uh, that um, this generalizes and there can be a destabilizing uh, uh, reaction uh, that can only be identified if you in implement system-wide liquidity stress tests. And that will not be easy, but it's something that we believe ought to be a major objective of the regulators. And finally, um, we think that um, the low interest rate uh, related risks for those insurance companies and pension funds should be much more closely monitored than they currently are. How are these going to be followed up? Well, they are, we say, a blueprint for medium term policy objectives. Uh, and we hope that the European Systemic Risk Board will develop some of them into concrete recommendations, which a recommendation of ESRB has a sort of comply or explain uh, uh, effect for national regulatory bodies. And that's what we would like to see in certain areas, at least. Uh, but there are also existing macroprudential tools that could be used better to deal with the risks from the low interest rate environment. And um, I conclude by just saying that uh, there are limits to what we have now in our policy toolkit. Um, you might say, oh, he's one of those policymaker types. He would say that, wouldn't, they, wouldn't he just want to expand you know, what they can do? Um, uh, more interference from the regulators. Uh, I think uh, the interference from the regulators after the global financial crisis uh, of 2008-2009 was on the whole beneficial. Um, not always, but certainly built up capital base in the banks, which stood us in good stead uh, last spring. Uh, and um, there is still, I think, more area, there are more areas where the regulators can do positively beneficial things. Uh, and uh, those in particular relate to structural changes in the financial system that interact with the low interest rate environment. Uh, and uh, the uh, structural changes that I'm talking about, of course, involve in good part a move in traditional banking activities and the related risks into
to non-bank financial mediation, and that means we're not the only ones to be saying this by any means. That's coming from Basel as well, uh, the BIS and the FSB, um, focus on macroprudential policies beyond banking, non-bank financial mediation. And more, uh, if we don't want to focus on institution, but activity, we want to look at activity-based regulation and market and, and, and how we handle markets beyond the existing entity-based regulation. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you very much, Richard. Um, if you could unshare your screen, we will turn to our discussants in Barbara Novick and Nicola Veron. Um, if I could just uh, say one word, it is important to note that this report and this task force were focused specifically on macroprudential measures and not the interaction with monetary policy or the use of monetary policy options. Uh, this is partly, of course, as Richard mentioned, uh, reflecting the institutional division of labor and the fact that the ECB governing council is undergoing its, is undertaking its review right now. But I would point out that there is a substantive benefit to this as well. There's a lot of loose talk and has always been about uh, since roughly 2009 about the idea that monetary policy could be used to puncture bubbles and control financial matters. Um, it's uh, important for us to recognize there are a bunch of other tools that have not yet been properly fully explored. Um, even though it is worth discussing how this interacts with monetary policy. Um, Lily, I'm going to have to ask you to, as host or someone to override Richard's camera so we can get full benefit of Barbara Novick and Nicola Veron. I'm trying, I'm trying to get these slides off screen. I thought I had stopped screen sharing. But, uh, but uh, I'm not doing very well here. So Adam, just a quick sound ah, check. Is there you go, Barbara. And now you're at the center of the screen where you should be. So okay. over, again, apologies to our audience. One final technical note. Um, the invitation members this is all on the record and this will all be posted on PIE website, but the invited members of the audience pre-registered may submit questions via the Q&A function on Zoom, which we will turn to with our panel after the two discussants. So Barbara, thank you very much. Over to you. Okay, so quick sound check. Is everything okay? Yes, unlike Richard, okay. you're fabulous. Okay, uh, so first of all, Adam, thank you for inviting me today. And Richard, uh, thank you for an excellent summary of a, a long report. Um, today's topic, obviously, a very important one. And low interest rates, we've now had them for a much more sustained period than any of us would have imagined when it began. And this has a dramatic impact on individuals as well as various types of entities. So just as a few examples, insurers find themselves in many cases earning less than the policies that they've written. Pension funds find themselves earning less than the actuarial rate that they need to provide benefits to plan participants over a long time. And individuals find that they can't retire or if they have retired, they're on a fixed income that has just shrunk dramatically. So not surprising in this environment, many of them have decided to look for extra income. We can call it the search for yield, um, but it is by necessity, and they are extending the duration of their assets in some cases, they're investing in private assets or going down in credit in various ways. And importantly, we need to understand the investment objectives and constraints for each of these groups and the individuals within them can differ quite significantly based on their investment horizon, the regulatory requirements that they have to comply with, or the accounting rules that apply to them. 
We also need to understand that their behavior is tied to the financial incentives that in many cases, in fact, in almost all cases, are being set by others that they don't have control of. And of course, we need to add banks, family offices, endowment, sovereign wealth funds, and others to this mix to have the full picture. And I think Richard said it well, um, the aggregation of all these different types of investors, that's the broader ecosystem that we often speak about, and that's where data is um, severely lacking. So what I'd like to do is just focus, you know, Richard's comments, note the impact on investors, um, but I'm concerned when I read the report, the focus very quickly goes to, well, what should we do about mutual funds? Um, because that's where we have a lot of data. And so while it's easy to observe them and study them, that's not necessarily the best answer. We need more transparency on the asset allocation behavior of these investors more broadly. And if you look at the numbers, the asset management industry is estimated to represent 25% of the investable assets. And mutual funds are a subset of that 25%. So we're talking about missing 75 plus percent of the investment universe. And before we make major changes to mutual funds, we really need a much clearer picture of that full ecosystem. I know the FSB and others are working on it, um, but I do think we should slow down a little before we steam ahead. Second thing I wanna talk about is understanding the data. Um, I am concerned that the report in some cases distorts or ignores actual mutual fund data. Um, so let me give, again, examples. The first is looking at funds that suspended redemptions. We now have sort of urban legend that this was a major problem during COVID. So let me run through some numbers and put it in context. We estimate 500 usage suspended redemptions during March, 2020, directly in response to COVID-related shutdowns of the economy worldwide. These break down to about 40 UK property funds and about 450 bond funds domiciled in Northern Europe, primarily Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. These bond funds suspended redemptions due to unclear prices on the underlying bonds. The actions were not in response to elevated redemptions. So while you might say, well, 500, wow, that's a large number. In fact, I think it's a large number. Um, keep in mind, it's from a universe of 33,000 usage. ESMA's report estimated eight and a half um, billion euro or 0.8%, so less than 1% of the aggregate universe of UK EU domicile bond funds suspended their redemptions. And the bottom line is during the crisis, liquidity risk management tools actually worked quite well. Doesn't mean that there isn't room for improvement and I can get into that, um, but it's different than saying all USITs need some kind of major overhaul, um, such as macroeconomic, macro prudential controls that have been suggested. My second example is on ETFs. And ETFs have certainly been the subject of more speculation than anything else in financial services, starting back with the great financial crisis. Obviously, growing quickly drew a lot of attention, and there was a lot of concern about how they would perform during a crisis. Well, COVID, for better or worse, gave us a real-life crisis and a very clear laboratory to see how they would act. And in fact, they added liquidity to a relatively illiquid underlying market. They provided price discovery. They enabled investors to trade continuously in markets that wouldn't otherwise been, been able to. And both iShares and others um, in this industry have produced a ton of data on various aspects of their performance during 2020. Even some uh, number of official sector reports now look at and cite the beneficial role of ETFs. I'll just quote one. The AMF recently wrote, ETFs acted more as a shock absorber than a shock amplifier during March 2020's market volatility. Even a more recent hypothesis, which suggested that ETF sponsors were putting bad bonds in the redemption baskets has been proven false 
using actual data on the baskets. So I, my recommendation here is before, again, before we make major changes to mutual funds, we need to fully test the various hypotheses that have been put forward because what we see over and over is that the actual data in off, often challenges um, the widely accepted narratives that have grown up. Let me um, turn now to addressing the specific recommendations. Uh, we can all agree that central bank intervention was decisive during March 2020, and we thank the various policymakers who were involved um, for coordinating with each other, um, for really being on top of just about everything. Um, and in co combination with the fiscal support that they provided to companies, the intervention helped to restore investor confidence, which in turn calmed the markets. But the markets were the central part of this whole problem. So looking at the recommendations, the first recommendation I'll touch on, improve liquidity reporting and making more effective use of available data. We totally agree. Um, getting the right data to the regulators is critical. And if you look prior to the great financial crisis, a lot of data was not being captured and there were a lot of unanswered questions as a result. Post great financial crisis, there's a whole body of regulation in different jurisdictions, mandating the reporting of significant amounts of data, especially on funds. And we encourage regulators to determine how to get the most out of this data. It's being collected, it's being reported, and let's see how we can share it, how we can use it to spot problems, to monitor issues. Um, we also recommend investing in automated and standardizing the data reporting um, wherever possible. We would go further and suggest that transparency is also beneficial for capital markets. And we saw that during COVID. Investor behavior in many cases reflects their confidence in markets, which is partially tied to having robust data sources. So for example, in Europe, developing a consolidated tape for equity and fixed income would provide a very valuable resource to all market participants and would allow better calibrated models to aid liquidity risk management decisions. To the same end, facilitating access to more granular data on end investor types and flows in and out of funds would improve asset managers' ability to model redemption behavior. The second re recommendation in the report that I'll touch on is about conducting a system-wide liquidity stress test. And I think Richard touched on some of the issues here. We agree that a system-wide perspective is important. However, as I noted earlier, there is relatively little data on the activity of market participants who are not asset managers, and especially not funds. And so a stress test of less than 25% of the ecosystem is clearly not a system-wide approach. It's a very narrow piece of a broader ecosystem. And in the absence of this additional information, I think it'll be critically flawed and it won't re reflect how the other um, investors would behave and may lead to some very bad recommendations and outcomes. The third recommendation in the report about moving toward macro prudential liquidity requirements. Here again, we agree that existing liquidity buffers need to be usable and releasable during periods of stress. We saw issues with banks where they continued to lend, but they ceased their market making activities. We saw issues with money market funds where they had sizable liquidity buffers, but they were tied to other features resulting in the buffers inadvertently becoming floors and in fact, causing pro-cyclical behavior. It makes sense to build these types of buffers for banks and non-banks during periods of non-stress and then be able to tap them during a liquidity event such as we just experienced. In addition, I should note that we realize that post great financial crisis reforms have constrained bank balance sheets. And therefore we also need to explore 
other ways to expand capacity for the markets. For example, modernization of fixed income markets using electronic and equity style trading would be quite desirable. I'm particularly concerned with the recommendations for macro prudential controls on funds, such as mandating liquidity buffers. As a starting point, these recommendations don't take into account fundamental differences between banks and mutual funds. Some commentators have suggested that mutual funds should be required to hold liquidity buffers, which they defined as cash and HQLA. HQLA being a very much a bank regulatory concept. While this measure makes sense for banks, it's not a very good way of managing or measuring liquidity in a fund. Investors in a bank or bank deposit, they expect to be returned their money at par. Now we could argue with negative interest rates, maybe it's par less a little, but essentially deposits are expected to come back at par. Investors in funds, on the other hand, explicitly take on market risk, including the risk of lower prices due to a liquidity premium. Funds look to meet redemptions by selling across their whole portfolio. And in the end, investors in funds have an equity stake in all of the assets held in the fund, so extremely different than a bank deposit. A fundamental aspect of managing mutual funds is managing this redemption risk. And without getting into all the details given time constraints, suffice it to say there are many variables involved, a couple of key ones, understanding in the investor base and their behavior in different scenarios, and different funds have different investor bases, building a portfolio with various layers of liquidity, that are different from fund to fund based on the underlying asset classes involved and using a full range of ex-ante tools to manage liquidity risk. Liquidity buffers as they've been proposed would be a drag on portfolio returns while not providing the protection that's being sought. Depending on the size of the buffer, they could be enough of a drag that the funds will go away because investors won't want that mix. In the event of significant redemptions, on the other hand, cash buffers would be inadequate because if there was really this run that people are concerned about, you would run through the cash buffer relatively quickly and you'd be back to selling assets across the portfolio. It could even be a pro-cyclical problem where that cash buffer becomes a floor as we saw with the money market funds. Instead, we would focus on improving the availability and practice of swing pricing and ensuring across jurisdictions the application of the full liquidity risk management toolkit. And we saw in the crisis, some jurisdictions allow different things than others. In fact, in the case of the Northern European bond funds, one of the big issues was uncertainty about the underlying bond prices and a criteria that required them to suspend redemptions. So it, it wasn't a choice thing, it was a requirement that should be looked at. So conclusion, let me just wrap up very quickly with a couple of observations. We agree on the need for good data, uh, for regulators to be able to monitor markets and make decisions. We agree that investors would be um, benefited by this, that they'd have more confidence, which impacts their decisions. We also agree on the need for a system-wide perspective, which means, of course, looking at more than mutual funds and more than asset managers, but really looking at all of these market participants. Just to put that point in perspective, I, I don't want to harp on it too much, but I think this is a, you know, very much about data. Coming out of the crisis, we heard that you know, there were a lot of selling of treasuries, and initially, some of the media reports went immediately to hedge funds. In fact, the Federal Reserve data highlighted that non-US investors were the driving force behind treasury bond sales. Likewise, when the SEC put out their report on the crisis, they estimated that US open-end funds could explain the activity of about one third of the activity in the corporate bond markets, one third. Somebody else was selling two thirds. 
Finally, we agree that certain liquidity buffers should be built and should be releasable during stress events. And that's not quite the case currently. Where we take the biggest um, exception is the imposition of the macro prudential controls on funds. They are fundamentally different than banks. Those differences need to be taken into account rather than trying to fit mutual funds into a bank regulatory model. And the specification of HQLA is a great example of that. We strongly urge the policymakers to look at these liquidity risk tools that are available and expand the toolbox in jurisdictions and really try and um, make the fullest tools available everywhere. In addition, we recommend testing those tools. So you wanna be sure that managers have tools that are fully operational when they're needed. I think there's a fair num amount of evidence that even in jurisdictions, people had tools, some managers used them, some managers didn't. Um, so I conclude there. I look forward to uh, Nicola's comments and the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, we're running a little long thanks to our audio problems and I appreciate everyone bearing with us. Nicola, over to you, please. Uh, thanks, Adam. I will be very succinct uh, for uh, in the interest of time and uh, with the hope of taking a few questions. Um, this is a big report. It covers a lot of ground. And uh, I really start from the report itself because I think it's, uh, it's very substantial. There's a lot in there. Uh, including not just uh, description uh, and recommendations, but also some evaluation. And I'll emphasize that. It's also an almost impossible exercise because this is a report about medium to long-term issues. Uh, the report says five to 10 year horizon at a time when the short term is so uh, uncertain and fast moving uh, as we have experienced in the last 15 months. And it's important to remember that the assignment for uh, Richard and his colleagues coming from the ECB and the ESRB came in late 2019. So uh, at the moment when it wasn't to be expected uh, what we uh, have been through. What strikes me in this report is uh, the way the scope of macroprudential policy has evolved uh, in the way it's described by the European Systemic Risk Board, which is the premier Macro prudential body uh, at the European level uh, in the institutional framework we have in the European Union. And what the report makes very clear is that uh, macro prudential policy, in the way they view it, uh, it goes well beyond tradition, what they call ma traditional macro prudential policy, which is basically you know, those buffers and ratios that many people have been talking about for years but actually encompasses all kinds of uh, issues uh, and policies relating to financial stability and the way to mitigate uh, the effects of um, financial cycles and monetary policy in terms of financial stability. And, and therefore, it does include a lot of structural policies uh, that are not just uh, the tweaking of this or that buffer or this or that ratio. Uh, the report says macroprudential policy is mostly done at the national level, but actually, if you take that broader definition, which includes lots of structural measures, it's not clear to me that it's done mostly at the national uh, level, and I would have uh, loved uh, with more time to challenge uh, Richard on this. One of the key points of the report is the emphasis on data and da data availability, and I think Barbara eloquently uh, emphasized that as well. Uh, I uh, think it would be very interesting in future iterations of that exercise to have more of a sense of how things have improved or not improved uh, in the last uh, five years, because that's the horizon since the last one. Uh, the European Central Bank has created an, uh, an extremely important data set called AnaCredit to look at credit exposures of banks uh, at the granular level. Uh, I, uh, so, so report says a little bit about it, but not much. I think it would be interesting to have more of this evaluation uh, dimension. And I, I say that, of course, uh, as I always uh, have to say, as a board member of one of the trade repositories, the uh, one uh, uh, operated by DTCC, and I see a lot of that uh, in that capacity, which is not the one uh, uh, in which I'm talking today, I see a lot of the data challenges. So basically, back to this theme of evaluation. Um, the question I, the report raised to me is really the lessons learned from the COVID 
19 episode. And I think we, we learned a lot in the last 15, 16 months uh, that uh, the report to uh, party alludes to, but, uh, but I think could be uh, the topic of a broader discussion on essentially what worked and what didn't uh, in terms of the post uh, great financial crisis lessons and more broadly in terms of the regulatory framework. What Barbara just said about ETF exchange trade funds, I think was one of those important lessons. We had a big question mark on how they would behave in a, a crisis and liquidity shock. Now we have much more of an answer and that's, a, that's an important uh, learning uh, experiment, experience. I think there are even broader ones on Basel III, which has been extremely important to have uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 shock, thanks goodness we had Basel III, which should be a, a, a lesson for future policy making because now we have a big uh, debate coming up in the EU on how to implement the last elements of Basel III. And the fact that this was so helpful, uh, a reform uh, coming into COVID-19, I think is very important. Same, I won't elaborate on IFRS 9, which uh, is an accounting standard to uh, account for uh, risk in financial instruments, and I think has withheld the uh, test of COVID-19 very uh, convincingly. So last point I will make, and sorry to be uh, longer than uh, what I wanted to say, uh, is on this idea that the uh, macro potential policy includes a structural approach. And I think this is a very helpful concept. The European Systemic Risk Board actually has been the pioneer of that by emphasizing for years, I think since 2014, or 13, how the structure of the European banking sector and the fact that Europe is basically overbanked with an obsolete and fragmented and uh, top heavy banking structure is a problem for systemic risk. And I think that's probably been the major contribution of the ESRB over the years. And I think this report uh, does emphasize the, the issue, but I think it could go even further in uh, suggesting remedies or at least avenues and analytical frameworks to think about this question of essentially adaptability, or if I can um, use a, a clunky word, restructurability of uh, European banks. A lot of this comes back to uh, ownership structures. M uh, the, the structures of European banks are made, make them very capital inflexible, uh, capital inadaptable. This is because they're state-owned or they have a controlling interest from a, an investor that cannot uh, contribute to capital increases um, or they're mutually owned uh, with cooperative structures. I would encourage the European Systemic Risk Board to pay more attention to these issues of bank ownership structures in which the EU is really an outlier in the world. All the Chinese banks are listed. Very few of the European banks, especially the medium-sized banks, which contribute most uh, to the overbanking, are listed, especially if you count listed with dispersed ownership. Uh, so uh, the ECB now, in its ca capacity as a supervisor, has access to data in a way that uh, makes it possible to have very granular analysis of banking system structures that weren't possible before. We also have experience of reform, particularly in Spain and Italy, that shows that it's possible to act on these issues. They're very difficult politically, but they're not in untouchable uh, when there is political will. And I think both Spain and Italy have made a lot of progress. Other countries like Germany and France less so uh, in the past 10, 15 years in terms of making those structures uh, more able to sustain uh, systemic risk, shocks and uh, un uh, unexpected events. So that will, I will conclude on this by saying this is, uh, in my view, a promising area of study for the next iterations of this very uh, useful exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, Richard, do you have a few responses to anything our discussants have raised? Oh, I would, but, but uh, maybe we can leave that uh, to uh, uh, after after the quick Q and A. No, no, I'm let's let's hear now. let's hear your responses, please. Yeah, let's just see. Great, you're now muted, Richard. This is, this is, we're having serious technical problems. Um, All right, so given that we've reached our hour and we're unfortunately unable to get Richard Sound in a form that does justice to his views and his substance, 
Um, I think we're going to have to call it there. There are very few questions on the Q&A. Um, Thank you um, very much, everyone, particularly Barbara and Nicola, and this is, uh, and his colleagues on the task force. The full task force report is, of course, available on the ESRB and ECB websites, and we have a link to it on the Peterson Institute website. The shorter version of their report, published by Vox AU, is also available, and the slides and comments from our discussions will be available on the PIE website henceforth. Again, uh, apologies and thanks for all who waited patiently. You, you, st you still have an echo there? Yes, 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 yes. Um, regrettably. Um, so on that note, 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 I will wish everyone a good rest of the day. And we will look forward to having Richard and the ESRB back uh, with better plumbing next time. Thank you all very much.